Nine-year-old Elizabeth Alton was the youngest of three children and lived with her mother Patty in St Martins, Missouri. A small rural town of just over a thousand people. Elizabeth loved all things theatre and performing and had just been cast in the school play, which she was throwing herself into wholeheartedly. She was running through her lines every day with anyone that would read the other parts with her, practising her songs and asking her siblings to act alongside her. She would find any excuse to dress up and sing along to Hannah Montana and Taylor Swift. Everyone said she was a very sweet, innocent and kind-hearted girl, always so friendly and caring and looking out for everyone she knew. She and her mother Patty were especially close, loving to bake together and play puzzles and games. October 21st, 2009 was a typical Wednesday. Everybody was back from school and the dinner was being cooked. One of Elizabeth's friends, Emma, knocked on Patty's door and asked if Elizabeth could go out and play with her. Patty at first said no because it was a school night and the family meal was almost ready. But after her daughter heard Emma at the door, both girls were relentless in trying to go out together, jumping up and down and begging for Patty to let them go. Emma lived just four houses away, and the pair and their other siblings were at each other's homes a lot. Patty told Elizabeth she had one hour and no more, and she wanted her home by six. 6.15pm. Elizabeth was still not home, and it was 15 minutes past the agreed time, which for a child as conscientious as Elizabeth was a reason to be concerned. The sun was setting, and Patty said there was no way her daughter would still be out voluntarily, as she was terrified of the dark. Patty called her phone, but it went straight to voicemail. She then rang Emma's grandmother Karen whom Emma and her siblings lived with. To her horror, Karen said she hadn't seen Elizabeth either, and she had no idea that Emma had even knocked at her door that afternoon. Patty hung up straight away and called the police. By 6.30, officers were at Patty's house and combing through the area. The street the family lived on was very close to about 60 acres of woodland, and this was a huge yet overwhelming focus for the search teams. The police headed over to Emma's house, but they all maintained she hadn't been there. Karen and Gary, Emma's grandparents, were so upset they had no idea this had all happened, but they simply couldn't give any information that would help. All they could do was join in the search. Despite the fact their houses were connected by the street, which would have only taken a few minutes to walk, Emma said they had been walking through and around the woods and had been darting in and out of the neighbouring lawns and backyards. She said an hour later, the incredibly diligent Elizabeth set off home as instructed. Emma said she watched her walk off, and that was the last time she had seen her. Officers said they still couldn't see any evidence that pointed towards foul play or anything untoward, suggesting maybe she had become lost in the woods, to which Patty replied, She's nine years old. She wouldn't just walk off by herself. Soon, almost a third of the whole town was out and looking. But the search party eventually had to slow down and stop for the night because of how dark it was. As soon as the sun rose, they were out in force again. A few hours later, with the concern continuing to mount, the FBI was called in to help and they moved quickly. This is KOMU 8 News at 6. Truly is a family's worst nightmare. In this case, nine-year-old Elizabeth Olton from Cole County has been missing since yesterday evening. Good evening. I'm Angie Bailey. And I'm Ryan Takeo in for Jim. Cole County authorities and volunteers have been searching for Elizabeth all day. KOMU 8's Brooke Hash is at the scene. Brooke, is there anything new? Ryan, I can tell you that the number of volunteers and law enforcement across the state have tripled 
since last night to more than 300 people. They are covering a half square mile grid search near Elizabeth Olton's home that is just behind me. She went missing last night around 6 p.m. on her way home from a friend's house just four blocks away. The search has not ended since then. There's no decision if or when it will end and no Amber Alert has been issued. The terrain is rough, hilly, and includes fields, forests, and ponds. Well, I think that the woods possibility is, you know, the kids in this area play in the, in the woods, in, in those farm areas back there. Behind me here is the VFW. This is where authorities and volunteers have been coordinating the search all day. Now, they're actually asking for no new volunteers. The outpour from the community has been outstanding. They just can't handle any more volunteers. Elizabeth reportedly had a cell phone on her when she disappeared. Officials hope they will be able to trace her location and are investigating her call history. Michael Amantea, KOMU 8 News, Cole County. Now, if you have any information, of course, contact the Cole County Sheriff's Department. The number is 573-634-9160. Registered sex offenders in the area were all interviewed. Each car coming in and out was stopped and searched. Dive teams and helicopters were deployed, and sniffer dogs were brought in too. The team started looking at Elizabeth's phone activity and ordered the information from her cell phone provider. The data arrived quickly and showed that her phone was still on and was actually pinging near her home and in the woods. It was now 24 hours later, a painfully long amount of time when dealing with a missing child. There were no items of clothing found, no dropped phone, no clues at all. Unfortunately, when they were searching the location that linked to her phone, her phone battery suddenly went dead and the pings stopped. The forest was dense, dark, damp and cold and there was a huge amount of ground to cover. The more time that was passing, the less likely it was seeming that they were going to have a positive outcome in the search for Elizabeth. The sheriff says the search is focusing on a section of woods which police have narrowed by triangulating Elizabeth's cell phone location. However, the battery has now died. Also, the search is being hampered by an uneven terrain, high brush, and soaking weather. I just want my little sister at home safely. And <laughs> right now, she's listed as an endangered missing person. Elizabeth's phone records also came back and they were able to look at her last contacts and messages. As well as her mother Patty and several others that could be easily accounted for, she had received a call that afternoon from someone called Alyssa. Six-year-old Emma then asked to talk to the police again. She now had a new story, but seemed scared to tell the detectives. She said that her half-sister had been the one to get her to knock on Elizabeth's door that afternoon. Her half-sister was 15-year-old Alyssa Bustamante. Emma said that when the two were outside playing together, Alyssa came and joined them and encouraged Emma to leave them alone. But Elizabeth said she had to head home and started walking off. This timed perfectly with the call that came from Alyssa. Emma walked back to her house and stayed outside playing alone, leaving Elizabeth and Alyssa out together. A while later... Emma, who was now back in her garden, fell over and caught herself on some thorns. She called out for help. Alyssa heard her from her bedroom and came outside. Emma said as she was helping her, she noticed something that looked like blood on Alyssa's clothes. Detectives asked Alyssa a few routine questions, and despite the fact she seemed open and forthcoming, something about what Emma had told them wasn't sitting right. If what Emma was saying was true... It meant that she hadn't been the last person to see Elizabeth that day. As far as they now knew, it was actually 15-year-old Alyssa Bustamante. It was now 48 hours later, and the investigating team had to regroup. It was now glaringly obvious that Elizabeth had not run away. She had either been led somewhere or forced somewhere, and officers started looking closer to home. As they began doing rounds of the houses again, a search party inside the woods made a strange discovery. 
a group of volunteers had stumbled upon a huge hole that had been dug up, then covered back over. They alerted police right away, but there was nothing under the soil. There was still no sign of Elizabeth or anything belonging to her in that area. When detectives had been at the Bustamante house talking to Emma and Alyssa, they had noticed several holes in the garden that looked similar in size and shape to this one. Given this, a warrant was issued to properly and intensely search the home. Although Elizabeth definitely hadn't been there that day, she would often go over and play, so they needed to take a good look around. Everything seemed normal and in order, until they entered Alyssa's room. It painted a very troubling and chilling picture. Everything was everywhere, and there was writing all over the walls, some parts in blood. There was also a drawing of an outline of a person, with the name Emma next to it, her six-year-old sister. Cards from her father who was in prison were scattered around the room, and, buried under everything, detectives found Alyssa's diary. One entry read, If I don't talk about it, I bottle it up, and when I explode, someone's going to die. They also noticed a paragraph that was scribbled over in blue pen. Fortunately, investigators were able to uncover some of the original writing by shining a light on the back of the paper. Two words stood out, slit and throat. Despite Alyssa saying she had been at school that day, it would turn out she had actually skipped lessons and her whereabouts around the time Elizabeth was last seen, as Emma was saying goodbye to her, weren't able to be confirmed by anyone either. Things were slowly being pieced together, but there were still so many gaps. Alyssa's diary was seized by the FBI and handed over to Sergeant David Rice, who was now preparing to interview the teen. Born in 1994, Alyssa came from a troubled and very broken family. Both her parents had substance addictions, her father was in and out of prison, and her mother would often leave the family home on drug binges. Eventually, Alyssa and her siblings went to live with her grandparents, Karen and Gary, who soon gained full custody of them. Karen said she adored Alyssa, and although the children had had a tough life, she did her best to raise them well shower them with love and care, and be a constant and supportive presence in their lives. As she entered her teenage years, Alyssa started self-harming and expressing suicidal feelings. She was admitted into a psychiatric hospital after she overdosed and began to cut words into her arms. Doctors that assessed her described her as violent and angry. She was diagnosed with severe depression and prescribed antidepressants. When she was released, things only began to get worse and more concerning. On her various social media platforms, she changed her list of hobbies to killing people and cutting. She often told friends and her boyfriend she wanted to know what it was like to kill someone and had a dream of burning down a house with a family inside. Her Twitter feed talked about a hatred of authority and people telling her what to do. One of her posts read, Bad decisions make great stories. She also posted a video to her YouTube channel called Idiots Getting Electrocuted by Electric Fence. The video showed her trying to get her two brothers to touch a fence that she knew would electrocute them. A disturbing pattern of behaviour was clear to see, and the more the FBI looked into her background, the more they found pointed towards her being a dangerous individual that wanted to inflict pain on people in the worst ways imaginable. After going through her diary some more, Sergeant Rice asked Alyssa to come in for a formal interview alongside her grandmother, and a juvenile officer. He said as the interview progressed, his tactic was to ask a question 
and sit in silence for as long as possible. Sometimes, for up to a minute at a time. He said as uncomfortable as it was, he knew the team would break eventually if there was something to say, which he was certain there was. He needed to know what had happened to Elizabeth that day, and he wasn't going to stop until he got to the truth. Alyssa started off by recounting her day. She said she had come back from school at around 3.30 and then had gone for a walk in the forest at around 4.30, 5pm. They now knew she was never at school that day, so she was already trapping herself in lies. She said she was supposed to take Emma on a walk with her, but ditched her as she was annoying, and instead went walking alone. She claimed she had come back about an hour later and was up in her room when she heard Emma shouting for help from outside. Sergeant Rice got her to retrace her steps with a map he had printed out. Do you want to like draw this for you? I have a map. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> now, the thing about this, this map, okay. I don't think it has Our where your actually house is. So the way I understand it's the new right house here. would be right about here. Is that yes. right? Okay, let's say the new house is ballpark here. Um, I'm not exactly sure how far back it goes. It's like past all the clearings, and then when it starts to get to like a smaller trail. So how long, when you got home about 3.30, how long were you at home messing around before you went on your walk, do you think? I was home at least an hour. Okay, hour. So, so about 4.30 or 5.00. Right. Well, there's, there's a, I believe that this little line here is the trail. Or something. But Did like, you go out all this way over yes. here? And There's, then where'd you go from here? I just kept following the uh Where path. does it go from here? Show me. I mean show me what does it loop back around then? No, no, it doesn't loop. It like goes this way, I think. Okay. And then what'd you do? And then there was a pasture I just hung out at the creek. And then then what'd you do? I came back. Then you walk back? Yes. And then what'd you do? I went home. It takes about... How long were you on your walk? It's about last week. Walk? It's about 15 or 20 minutes. Okay, so you were gone about an hour. Alyssa said after this, everybody went to church and got home at around 8pm. Rice then changed the line of questioning and moved on to the holes around her garden and around the woods. Alyssa calmly admitted to having dug them herself, but said it was because she liked digging holes and sometimes buried dead animals in them. Well, you know, there's been, uh, and there were some folks out there uh, out in the forest, I guess, digging some holes or looking at some holes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I guess you know, they had said that you like to go out there and, and dig holes, so I mean, uh, I'm going to have to ask you some stuff about yourself. Tell me about these holes you dig. Well, you dig them a certain way? Just wherever they're at. I mean, do you dig a certain spot or what? Oh. And you can understand why, as uh, if people were out in the woods looking for, yeah. if looking for a person yes. if they were lost, or God forbid, looking for if they thought it was a, you know, God forbid, a body. Have you dug a hole like this before then, or is this the first time? It's not completely like this, but it's like kind of like that. Okay. Like so this big enough for a shoebox. Okay, but this is the first time of that size. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, what about the big round ones that I keep kept falling in? And I mean, they're deep. <laughs> and I was getting telling me, did you guys quit doing this? Because they're dangerous. And we used to ride our horses up there, and I could break sure. I mean, they're huge. Okay. There's like three or four of them. Yeah. He then said, what kind of person do you think would do this to a nine-year-old girl? Alyssa shrugged and said, I don't know, a sick person, someone that can put down all their morals. She was still maintaining that she had never been out with Elizabeth on her own. It was always in a group of siblings, and she had been trying her best to help find her as well. What do you know about this whole investigation or mess? She's still missing. They're out looking for her. They don't want her off here. It's, this is really big. They've had helicopters yeah, they searching have. as well. And I don't know, that's pretty much what I know. I really don't think she would run away because she's nine. I think that maybe someone kidnapped her or something. It's a terrible thing. I, I don't know what else to assume. Is there anybody in that area you can think of that would 
that comes to mind that you would think of that would that would do that? Is there anybody that knowing your neighbors that you would after this, he started asking questions about Elizabeth's phone, explaining that the data did not lie, and it was indicating that her phone was somewhere behind Alyssa's house, which he showed her on a map. He then moved on to Alyssa's house and her bedroom. Now, it's my understanding that uh, did the FBI do a search or something of of the house where you guys lived. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. What what was that all about? You said they searched your room. Yes. Other marijuana seats and that sort of stuff. Did they did they find anything? Nope. Okay, did they take anything? Um, they took my sheet and okay. the pillowcase, I okay. think. Did they take anything else? Um, I don't think so. I haven't really surveyed anything. Okay. Okay. I think they took clothes. Oh, so they took a pair of pants okay. and a diary. I mean, they gave us the list. I, it's not all coming to me what was on the list, but there's a long list. Your diary. Okay. You ever gone through the diary? I've, I've looked at some of it, yes. Okay. Did you know that? No. Does it make you angry? Oh, no. Yeah. It's kind of your private, private, personal thoughts, isn't it? When Rice confronted her about the entries, including the one that had been scribbled over, the interview would take a drastic turn. We talked a little bit earlier about technology. Mm -hmm. Even if you write something down and then you take a pen and try real hard to scratch it out, mm -hmm. that doesn't make it go away. Okay. It's still there. What we want to do is find out what happened to the little girl. I need to know what the truth is. Okay. We have your diary. We've read your diary. Mm -hmm. Including the last entry. Mm -hmm. Where she at? I don't know. You need to tell us the truth. You need to tell us what happened. If this isn't, if this was an accident, that's fine. We can deal with that. This family needs closure. Okay. Let's start at the beginning. Is this something that was planned out or was this just an accident? Uh, we're just touching around. <laughs> She died. I didn't know what to do. So I burned her body. Who helped you? Nobody. We're out in the forest. I did. Great bed. Had a great bed. Alyssa said the pair had been playing out in the forest and Elizabeth had fallen, hit her head and died instantly. Panicked, she had tried to conceal her body by burning it. But given the final entry in her diary, Rice knew this wasn't true. But it was the start of the truth coming out. He just had to keep chipping away and poking holes in her stories. The entry in her diary that had been scribbled over had now been completely uncovered, and it read as follows. I just fucking killed someone. I strangled them and slit their throats and stabbed them. Now they're dead. I don't know how to feel at the moment. It was amazing. As soon as you get over the, oh my God, I can't do this feeling, it's pretty enjoyable. 
I'm kind of nervous and shaky though right now. K. I gotta go to church now. Lol. It had been written on the same day Elizabeth had gone missing, October 21st. Rice told her they would find Elizabeth's body eventually, and when they did, an autopsy would tell them the full story. And I understand you said she fell, and that's why she died. However, they will know from the autopsy if she was shot, if she was hit in the head, if her throat was cut. How did she die? Nine-year-old girls don't just die. Was her throat cut? Yeah. Is it true you said then you burn her body? Okay, is that part true? Mm -hmm. So is her body should still be there? I burned it and then I like scattered it in the in the creek. Into the creek? Yes. It's a creek full of water? Yes. Alyssa told Rice that she had bumped into Elizabeth and Emma outside, and once Emma had gone, everything started to unravel. Despite her denials it was pre-planned, she was already armed with a kitchen knife. Holding the nine-year-old's hand, the pair walked for 15 minutes, deep into the forest. With Alyssa telling her she had something to show her, they just had to walk further in. Once they reached a certain spot, Alyssa said she beat and strangled her before slitting her throat and stabbing her repeatedly. The fear that Elizabeth must have felt as the forest got darker and she realised her life was in danger is unimaginable. Alyssa then said she had attempted to burn her body before digging a hole to bury her and disposing of everything else in the creek. However, Rice knew that the hole had not been dug on that day. It had been dug days before, as were all the other holes they had found. She didn't go out there with a shovel or anything she could have used to do this, and there was no way she could have killed Elizabeth, dug a hole to bury her, and been back home within the hour to go to church. If Rice could get her to admit to pre-digging the hole, it would help to prove premeditation. You didn't have a shovel with you. I had a knife. You, could, you, you didn't dig that hole with a knife. You did not dig. I was out there for five hours. You didn't dig that hole with the knife. I don't get Friday. Everybody still found it hard to believe that Alyssa had managed to do this all by herself, but she swore it was just her, and she was the only one that knew about it. What we're going to do right now is kind of get some things lined up to, um, to go out there and have them point out uh, that side where she's at. Would you be able to do that? Alyssa Bustamante agreed to take Rice to her remains, and with this, just 15 minutes from her home, the search for Elizabeth Alton came to a devastating end. A day after Elizabeth was found, police announced that they had placed the 15-year-old under arrest and she had been charged with first-degree murder. The neighbourhood was horrified. Officials confirmed today they are seeking a petition of first-degree murder against a 15-year-old suspect for the killing of 9-year-old Elizabeth Olton. The case now centers on letting the court decide if the suspect should stay in trial as an adult. 
that starts with a closed detention hearing tomorrow. After the detention hearing, the court will hold a certification hearing November 18th to determine whether or not to try the suspect as an adult. Among factors the court will consider are whether a history of violence is present, as well as the suspect's age, maturity, and sophistication. Now there's only about six houses on the entire street. It's a very small community. So even though officials won't release the identity of the person being held for the killing, many people have already figured it out. Until after the certification hearing that you not release the identity of that individual. That's what we're asking at this point. Police had also interviewed Alyssa's boyfriend and asked him to undertake a polygraph test. We know a lot more stuff than we're leading on to, to believe. We've talked to several people. So what do you know? Why is the polygraph telling me different? Why is your body telling me different? Would you say? No. Although they suspected he likely knew something had happened, they determined he didn't have anything to do with the murder of Elizabeth, and he was never implicated in anything. Other than the fact she had just wanted to know what it was like to kill someone, given her diary entry, there was no other explanation. She had dug two graves in the weeks before, and essentially waited for an opportunity. It remains undetermined who, if anyone, the second grave was intended for, but police suspected she was actually planning to kill her two younger brothers. On October 28th, a week after she had gone missing, Nine-year-old Elizabeth Alton was laid to rest. Her favourite colour was pink, and her funeral was filled with the colour. A horse-drawn carriage carried her pink and white casket. The community was a close one, and it was packed with people standing along the sides and waiting outside. The emergency responders and investigators were also sat in the first several rows. The case had deeply affected and moved everybody. I hope justice is served. I really do. Because it's not right. She was innocent. She didn't do nothing. She deserved to be killed the way she was killed. She didn't have a chance at life. It was all hugs and, I mean, holding each other and such like that. I mean, it just, it was harder to leave than it was to get there. Like I said, she was my bug. I mean, she's, she's my heart. I mean, I bought a house in, out in Russellville, and the whole room was pink. It was all Barbie and everything. She was outgoing. She's active, loved riding her bike. I have her picture on my wall, okay? Every time I, I look up at it, I, I want to cry. I get mad. I get angry. I feel sorry. Every night I tell her I, I love her. And I'm sorry I wasn't there to protect her. Every single night. Okay. I just wish that it never happened. People who don't know you may see you on camera and, and think, you know what, he's behind bars. Why should I feel sorry for this guy? Don't feel sorry for me. Feel sorry for my daughter. Okay. I mean, feel sorry for her siblings. Okay. I feel sorry for the world because they're missing out on a beautiful child. I have my guilt. Okay, I've done wrong. Okay, I, I wouldn't be here otherwise. You know, I should have been out there protecting my daughter. I should be out there every day protecting my family. If I could, I'd go back and do that. In November 2009, despite her lawyers pushing for her to get a lesser charge, on the grounds of a troubled childhood and her age. 15-year-old girl from Jefferson City area will be tried as an adult of first-degree murder charges. Alyssa Bustamante is... The judge ruled that Alyssa Bustamante would be tried as an adult and she was therefore indicted. She entered a plea of not guilty and trial preparation got underway. Just as Elizabeth's family and the prosecution thought they were finally getting somewhere, a huge blow came. In June 2011, her defence team requested that her lengthy confession to Sergeant Rice was thrown out. A judge ruled that because of her age and the line of questioning put forward by the juvenile officer working alongside Rice, 
at least part of her statement, would not be admissible in court. After this, her trial was delayed and set for early 2012. The prosecution knew they were really up against it, and after going back and forth, thinking of the best approach, they decided to offer the option of a plea deal to Alyssa, second-degree murder, instead of first-degree murder. With this, Alyssa Bustamante withdrew her not-guilty plea for first-degree murder and pleaded guilty to second-degree murder instead. This also spared her the chances of receiving the death penalty. The courtroom was packed, and everybody wanted to know what would happen. As part of the deal, Alyssa had to recount what had happened that day. As she went through what she had done, in all its awful detail, reporters in the court said the tension was palpable, with everybody sitting in stunned silence. Her defence team also spoke, and leaned heavily on her childhood and upbringing, mental health issues, and claiming that her prescribed medication made her more prone to violence. Despite all of this, Alyssa Bustamante was sentenced to life in prison for second-degree murder and 30 years for armed criminal action, and the sentences were to be served consecutively. Several months after she pleaded guilty, however, the United States Supreme Court ruled that juveniles cannot face automatic life sentences without the possibility of parole. So, under Missouri's law, Alyssa may seek parole after 30 years. Patty gave a speech at her sentencing. She was so upset and physically shaking, the judge eventually asked her to stop talking. All Alyssa could say in response was, I cannot even understand what you guys are going through, adding that she would give her life to bring Elizabeth back. A detective said it was in this moment Karen and Gary got up and walked out of the courtroom and everybody could see Alyssa suddenly realise that the only two people that had stuck by her and tried to be a constant in her life, had just walked away. Patty said that everything that came out of Alyssa's mouth was a lie. She had no remorse, and she was being told what to say by her lawyers. The prosecutor, Mark Richardson, said he had never seen anything like this in his life, and he hoped to never have to try a case like it again. The motive has to be the most senseless, reprehensible that could be in humankind and that is to take a life for a thrill, he said. A forensic psychologist added it was clear from her patterns of behaviour over the years, it was only a matter of time before she killed somebody. Patty went on to sue not only Alyssa, but the hospital where Alyssa sought treatment. She believes that the healthcare system should have seen the red flags and taken preventative measures. A judge threw out the lawsuit against the hospital but the lawsuit against Alyssa was successful and she will ultimately owe Patty $5 million. Alyssa appealed her sentence in 2014, but this was denied. The events that transpired so very quickly on October 21st, 2009 rocked the town and shattered the closeness of the community. Patty said she misses her daughter's kindness and her ability to see the good in everyone and everything a friendly and innocent young girl, excited for her starring role in the school play, just playing with her friends and siblings, enjoying the simple pleasures that childhood brings. Her life was snatched away in the most frightening way imaginable, and the damage done to so many people on that day will forever be felt. Thank you all for tuning in and we hope you found this video interesting. If you'd like to support our channel and help us to continue to make content, please don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe. It helps us so much and we really appreciate it.